Well, good afternoon, everybody. I'm Dave Jones, and uh, I uh, am happy to be here today. Uh, this is a little new experience. Um, I would say probably 80% of the programs I do are in senior living communities. So I'm speaking to groups of, in assisted living facilities. I, I did one earlier this afternoon, and so uh, that's kind of typical. So this is a new experience for me. But uh, Kim and I worked together a number of years ago, and that's how we got connected. So. Um, I've got 10 topics and I go all over the place, mostly in the Twin Cities metro area, but I've been to Rochester, Mankato, St. Cloud, and so anyway. So <clears throat> my story today is about the time when we went to the moon, and uh, the title is Apollo, Why We Went to the Moon. So the word Apollo is the name of NASA's program that got us to the moon. Why we went to the moon there's a little bit of danger in a title like that. It, it sort of makes you think that I know why we went to the moon. So to be clear, this is my opinion from studying this event. Uh, I would say this story of going to the moon, it, it, it was a very unique moment in history. There were things going on in this country and in the world and these are like political and social things. And those things came together at a point in history and they made, them say, made us say, we're going to the moon and we're going right now. And I think that you could construct an argument that if those things had not been happening in quite the same way or not coming together at the same time, we might not have made it to the moon and I think you could make an argument that we might not have even tried. We might have given up about halfway through the effort. So, a uh, very unique moment in history. But I like to start with a phrase that, you know, m chances are that most everybody in the room has used this phrase at least once, and it goes like this. If we can put a man on the moon, then, and you fill in the blank, okay? And we use that, you know, with big things like we ought to be able to you know, educate our children and feed the hungry, but then we also use it with, you know, I don't know, day-to-day -day things like they ought to be able to build a clock radio I can program or something like that, you know? Okay, so it's just an expression and we probably aren't giving it a lot of thought, but what we're doing when we use this expression is we're saying that was the ultimate and we got that done, so why can't we get some of these other things done that we seem to talk about and talk about and never make progress on fixing or solving and sometimes you know what I'm talking about it feels like we talk about it we say we're gonna try to fix it but we really never even try to fix some of these problems so why but that, well, that was the ultimate win one and we got that done so going to the moon the greatest commitment of national resources to a peaceful pursuit in the history of the nation just to set the stage, we landed on the moon the first time July 20th, 1969. Two men walked on the moon that day. Their names were Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin. They were part of a mission called Apollo 11. Remember, Apollo is the name of NASA's program that gets us to the moon. And during that whole Apollo program, we actually made nine trips to the moon. We landed six times. So there were three times we went to the moon and didn't land. And no human has been back to the moon since December of 1972. Now there are a lot of ways to tell the story and there are also a lot of points at which you could start the story. I'm going to start the story at the end of World War II. Shortly after World War II we enter this period called the Cold War. And the Cold War is about communism versus capitalism. You, which is the better system of government, the better economic system, the better social system. You had these two superpowers, the Soviet Union and the United States. Now, during the Cold War, the two sides are suspicious of each other, they're fearful of each other. The last thing either side wanted to have happen was to have the other side gain any sort of an advantage. Uh, and the fact that we were in this thing called the Cold War played a huge role in the story I'm going to be telling. Now the Cold War is generally thought to have 
started around 1947 or so and went till about 1989, 1990. When the Cold War ended, the Soviet Union collapses and it breaks into a number of smaller countries. The, the largest one of those smaller countries is, uh, is Russia. That's the largest of those smaller countries. So now you're hearing in the news about Russia might be invading the Ukraine. See, what, they're try what people think they're trying to do is that Vladimir Putin is trying to reestablish the Soviet Union, okay? So that's what's going on. That's why this is a big deal. And I bet there are some people in the room who weren't even born in 1989, I'm guessing, okay? <laughs> Um, when I talk to those 85 year olds in the assisted living facility, they know what I'm talking about, <laughs> the Soviet Union. But anyway, now, so this is, kind of, th th this is what's happening while this story of going to the moon. Now, so now you move into the 1950s. There is nothing man-made in outer space, but it's coming. And a lot of people in this Cold War are starting to think that what is space going to be used for? A lot of people thought it would be used for military purposes. The country that conquers space is going to conquer the world. Okay? Well, and then we are hearing rumors in the 50s that the Russians are making progress building something called the Intercontinental Ballistic Missile, ICBM. And it's a rocket with a bomb on it that you could launch, for example, from Russia and aim it at the United States. Well, in, in the year 2022, pretty much everybody has this technology, but in the 50s, nobody does. And we're hearing rumors that the Russians are getting closer to building this thing. Well, the first step into outer space would be with something called a satellite. And a satellite is nothing but a piece of hardware that orbits the Earth. Well, see, one thing that was going on during the Cold War is the Russians were doing things in secret. They would not announce what their plans were. They would just do something and then they would announce this to the world and they'd catch us off guard. On the other hand, in the United States, we are announcing our plans. We would, we would announce, it'd be in the papers. On Tuesday the 12th at 10 in the morning, we are planning to launch a rocket. And so the TV cameras would show up and they would record what happened, success or failure. And believe me, there were a lot of failures. So those are two very different approaches, right? Well, the first step into space would be with something called a satellite. Well, in October of 1957, the Russians announced catching us off guard. We didn't know they were planning to do this. They had put the first man-made satellite in orbit around the Earth. It was called Sputnik. Sputnik is a round metal ball, it weighs about 180 pounds, it's 23 inches in diameter, so about two, inches, two feet across. They put this thing in orbit and all it could do was beep. It couldn't take pictures, it couldn't process data, it just beeped, that's all it could do. But see, the problem was here in the United States, we go to sleep one night, we wake up in the morning and we find out there is now something Russian made orbiting the Earth. What's going on? How did this happen? So a lot of people are starting to weigh in on this thing. And I have a quote next, and here's, you won't probably recognize this name. His name was Eric Severide. Now he was kind of what you could call him sort of a pioneer in broadcast journalism. So he goes on the air two days after Sputnik is launched, and I'm gonna put a quote up from him up here that's kind of a famous quote. Uh, he, he, but before I show you the quote, remember what I said? All Sputnik could do was beep. Two days later, here is what Eric Severide said about it. He said, if the intercontinental missile is indeed the ultimate, the final weapon of warfare, then at the present rate, Russia will soon come to a period during which she can stand astride the world, its military master. Holy cow. In 2022, you read that and you want to say, Calm down here. Now, yeah, that was a big achievement. But what you're saying, what he is saying, now this is the middle of the Cold War, he is saying the sky is falling and the world is coming to an end. So you're fanning the flames of fear and concern. So the next thing I'm going to do is show you two short video clips, and these are each just about a minute long. And these are newsreels. Now, uh, many of you could probably ask your grandparents about newsreels. This was something before people had TVs, you could go to the movies 
and they would show this thing before the movie started. It was one of the ways that people would learn about what's going on in the news. And I love newsreels as someone who loves history because they sort of take you back to a moment in time and here's what people are worried about and here's the way they talked and the way they dressed and the way they thought. Well, this first newsreel was created to explain Sputnik to the American people. I don't get it. What's a satellite? What is Sputnik? I don't understand this. So it's actually animated. And it, it's, a, it's only a minute long, but it explains Sputnik to the American people. So I'm going to cue this up. I got a couple speakers right by your shoulder, so I don't want you to um, be startled when suddenly sound comes out from the behind there. So, okay, so here we go. in the sky, a 23-inch metal sphere placed in orbit by a Russian rocket. Here, an artist's conception of how the feat was accomplished. A three-stage rocket. Number one, the booster in the class of an intercontinental missile. Its weight estimated at 50 tons. The smaller second stage took over at 5,000 miles an hour and carried on to the highest point reached. 500 miles up, the artificial moon is boosted to a speed counterbalancing the pull of gravity and released. You are hearing the actual signals transmitted by the Earth-circling satellite. One of the great scientific feats of the age. So those are the real beeps. You know, I get, I get people will tell me stories. You know, sometimes they'll say, I remember this. I, you know, if you would go out in the country so you're away from the city lights, you could actually see this light going overhead. And if you had a certain kind of radio, you could listen. I mean, it seems pretty primitive to today, wasn't it? You know, to think about it. But that's what, that was such a big deal. Is this thing is orbiting the Earth? Okay, so now you say, I get it. I understand what a satellite is. I understand Sputnik. So my next question is, how did this happen? How did the Russians get such a big jump on us? So the next newsreel is President Eisenhower responding to those questions. This one is also just a minute long, and uh, I'm gonna. Uh, clue you in about two things that he talks about before I show you this. The first word out of his mouth is Vanguard, and Vanguard was the name of our program to put a satellite in orbit, Vanguard. Then he refers to something called the International Geophysical Year. International Geophysical Year. And that was just this time period, it was actually, they said it was called it a year, but it was actually about 18 months where scientists from all over the world had gotten together and they said, we think science has advanced to such a degree that during this time frame, let's try to do a bunch of big, bold experiments to demonstrate advances in science. One of the recommendations of that group, that scientific group, was that any country that is ready and able to launch a satellite try to do so during the International Geophysical Year. So that's what that's about. So this is President Dwight Eisenhower. assures the nation that Russia's success with the first satellite does not indicate a serious lag in American rocket research. Vanguard, for the reasons indicated, has not had equal priority with that accorded our ballistic missile work. Speed of progress in the satellite project cannot be taken as an index of our progress in ballistic missile work. Our satellite program has never been conducted as a race with other nations. Rather, it has been carefully scheduled as part of the scientific work of the International Geophysical Year. I consider our country's satellite program to be well designed and properly scheduled to achieve the scientific purposes for which it was initiated. We are, therefore, carrying the program forward in keeping with our arrangements with the international scientific community. Okay, so what the, so what the president is trying to do here is he's trying to say to everybody, let's calm down. Yes, the Russians made a big, you know, advancement, but don't worry because we have plans, we're working on them, we're moving forward, so just 
just calm down everybody that's what he's trying to do so the next thing I want to talk about the next thing I want to show you is related to President Eisenhower's approval ratings now President Dwight Eisenhower was a very popular president he served two terms eight years his approval rating get this was usually between about 55 percent and 75 percent now today I don't care what party you're in nobody gets approval ratings like that anymore okay so he was very popular president so I have a chart that tracks his approval rating over time and here it is so the green that's the those are the people saying I think he's doing a good job okay the red are the disapprovals he's doing a bad job the yellow are the you know 10% of people who will you know pretty much always answer I'm unsure okay so his approval rating reached its peak in the fall of 1956 so he's up for re-election okay and he has a 79% approval imagine that the American people get a chance to say should we give this guy another term as our president and he has a 79% approval rating well guess what the 56 election was a landslide well then after the election's over, things will back off a little bit. Almost a year goes by. It's now the fall of 57 and Sputnik is launched. Look what happened to his approval rating after that. It dropped down to 49%. Now, what that says to me is that the American people are not listening to the president who's saying, calm down everybody, we're on track. Instead, they're listening to people like that Eric Severide who said the sky is falling and the world is coming to an end. So I, th I would bet that President Eisenhower thought, okay, clearly the American people are not buying what I'm selling. We need to do something concrete and substantial to show both the American people and the world that we are serious about space. So <clears throat> that 49% comes right at the beginning of 1958. In the middle, in the, in the spring of 58, we have a report from this group, the President's Committee on Outer Space. They lay, issue a report and they lay out the science, and there's you know all kinds of science, of course, and they try to put it in terms that, in theory, the average person could just pick it up and read it and understand what you're talking about. And also, they made the case. This is going to be risky. This is going to be expensive. So here's why we think it's worth it. We need it for national defense. We need it for global prestige. You know, the Russians have gotten ahead of us. We're not looking quite as good. We want to know what's out there. We have this longing. Humans, as humans, we have this longing to know what's beyond Earth. And so for these reasons, we think it's worth it to pursue space. So then, the president makes a move. Now, that's, that's March of 58. In the middle of 58, the president makes a move that I think was brilliant. In the middle of 58, he announces the creation of NASA. And this is the National Aeronautics and Space Administration. This is the agency that will take us into space. So what's brilliant about that? Well, up to this point, each one of the branches of the military were sort of competing or vying. They each one wanted to be christened as the space agency. Each one thought we could do space better than anybody else. And Dwight Eisenhower says, no. He says, NASA is going to be a civilian agency. And that was a statement in the middle of the Cold War that the United States is not looking at space as being about conquering the world. We're looking at space as being about science and learning and adventure. And that was kind of a bold move and it would have been so easy in the middle of the Cold War to make this a military agency. But nope, it's going to be civilian. And in hindsight, I think that was a brilliant move. So now NASA is created and then they a few months after that they announce their first program and it was called Project Mercury now Project Apollo is the one that got us to the moon that was actually program number three this was program number one so they announce their first program is we're gonna get into space and they announce the first seven astronauts these guys are going into space on behalf of the American people they're called the Mercury 7 the Mercury 7, uh, these guys, the day before the announcement, nobody knows who any of these guys are. But the day after the announcement, they've turned into huge celebrities. Who are they? Where do they come from? What sort of training are you going to have to have to go into space? Now, they've been named, 
and it's going to be a while until they actually go into space. But uh, they, they've been named, okay? So now in this picture of the Mercury 7, uh, the, th the third one from the left in the yellow vest is John Glenn. Now he died a number of years ago, but he was a senator, and he was the last surviving member of the Mercury 7. So, uh, and some of these other names that you might recognize, Alan Shepard, Gus Grissom, Grissom Scott Carpenter, Deke Slayton, uh, anyway, more, I, don't quiz me on the Mercury 7, I, I could, uh, uh, Wally Shira, and I think I'm missing one, but anyway. So anyway, so these guys were famous for their day, okay? So it's going to be a while till they go into space, but they've been named and they're going to start training. So now we move into 1961, and we have a new president, John F. Kennedy. He takes office in January 61, and, and in his presidency, we were having some problems the first few months, really, real serious problems, and people were starting to question, does this guy have what it takes? So four months into his presidency, he goes to Congress, and he delivers a very famous speech in May of 61, and in this speech he says, I believe this nation should commit itself to achieving the goal before the decade is out of landing a man on the moon and returning him safely to the earth. Now when he was saying that's our goal, we didn't know how to do that, but he was saying we'll do this and we'll get it done, we'll figure it out and we'll do it and we'll do it before the end of the 1960s. Now, part of what he was trying to do was change the focus of the nation. You see, he was trying to say, look folks, don't, let's not keep talking about all these problems we've been having the last couple months. Let's look ahead. Let's look to the future. We're going into space. Let's go to the moon. Let's talk about stuff like that. Not these problems we've been having. Well, the way that he laid this thing out, it created a quantifiable goal. And what does that mean? Well. Up to this point, people are saying, we can't let the Russians beat us. We have to win. But how would you ever figure out who wins in something like space exploration? But the way he laid this thing out creates a goal. It is, it's just like two kids on the playground at recess. Hey, I'll race you to the end of the playground and back. First one back wins. And everybody in the room did it at one point, And we all understand it. We know what the deal is. And they say that that even if you were somebody in this country and maybe you had no involvement in the program, no interest, don't care about it a bit, you could still articulate what the ultimate goal was. And they say there are estimates that maybe as many as 400,000 people worked on this program in some capacity or another. Some of them it's like designing a little switch or something like that. 400,000 people and every single one of them would have been able to say this is our goal. There's no question. That becomes critical in terms of uniting and unifying us. Well, you may have heard when I played the clip of President Eisenhower, he says we do not consider this to be a race with other nations. Well, sorry Mr. President, but that is exactly what this turned into. So I'm going to hit some of the high points of the space race. So the space race starts I'm, I'm leaving out a lot of stuff, just I'm hitting some of the high points. Space race starts October 57 with Sputnik. And then people would say, okay, that's all good and fine, a piece of hardware in orbit around the Earth. I wonder if a living being could survive in outer space. So the Russians won this one again. They, again, they caught us by off guard a month after Sputnik. They announced, catching us off guard, they had put a capsule with a dog inside of it. It was a female dog named Laika. And they put it in, they, they announced that they put Laika into orbit. And they said she did just fine. She survived and thrived in outer space. Now, here is what they announced in 1957. They said, we don't currently have the technology to bring her back to Earth. So after a few days in orbit, Laika was euthanized. But the Soviet Union collapses about 1990 and a about a dozen years later, some information the Russians had kept hidden away leaks out. And we found out what really happened. Now this is 1957 and we didn't find out until about 2002 or 2003. What really happened on that flight, the dog was not euthanized. What happened was 
After about six hours in orbit, the dog essentially roasted to death. Now, what if we would have known that in 1957? That would have changed how we viewed this thing, you see? But as it was, we saw one success, two success, we don't even have a satellite in orbit. We're way behind. So another month goes by, we're ready to launch Vanguard, our first satellite. So we announce the date and the time, the TV cameras uh, show up, the rocket lifts up off of the launch pad, goes up in the air about 10 feet, and the rocket explodes. The satellite never makes it into orbit. Now, if you want to see something, Google Vanguard rocket explosion and watch this video on YouTube. It is the biggest fireball you have ever seen. And nobody got hurt. It was all unmanned, but it is the biggest fireball you've ever seen. So we're way behind. We're never going to catch up. And it's not until the end of January 58 we finally get our first satellite called Explorer 1. So now we're in the game, but we're way, it feels like we're still way behind. So both countries continue doing things. Now it's 1961 and we're ready to put the first, or I'm sorry, they're talking about putting humans in space. Well, guess who won that one? In April of 61, the Russians announced they'd put a cosmonaut named Yuri Gagarin into orbit around the Earth. First human in outer space. And it was about three weeks later that Alan Shepard became the first American in space. Now, you might look at that on paper and say, three weeks, you know, that's not, that's not too much. But then people would say, wait a minute now, wait, wait, wait. Let's compare these two missions. Al this is Alan Shepard's mission. He launches, goes up in the air, and came right back down. The whole thing lasted 15 minutes. Crossed into space for about five minutes. That's all it was. Yuri Gagarin actually orbited the Earth. That's far more difficult, far more complicated, and far riskier. So people would say, you can't compare these two. We're still way behind. Now, it isn't until early 62 when John Glenn becomes the first American to orbit the Earth. And this sort of becomes a turning point. People started to say, well, okay, maybe now there's a chance that we can catch up and get ahead. And, and by that point, we also now had the goal of the moon. Okay? So a little bit of a turning point. Why we went to the moon? First of all, competition. Competition makes you push, strive, catch up, get ahead, stay ahead, meet your deadlines. If you're not competing with somebody, it's easy to let deadlines slide. Also, as we move through the 1960s, we had what I call a martyred president. John F. Kennedy set, is the one who set us on this course, and then he was assassinated in 1963. And then I think as we move through the 60s, that becomes a factor. We need to do this in his memory as part of his legacy. And then we decided as a nation to commit unlimited money to this program. Now, I don't mean truly unlimited, but I want to show you something. I have a chart that tracks the budget for, for NASA. It's, a, it's adjusted for inflation. Here it is. Today, the budget for NASA, I think I need to update that. It's actually more like 22 or 23 billion with a B every year for NASA. Uh, but and really adjusted for inflation, you can see it's been pretty flat for decades. Now the red line is when we landed the first time. See that peak back there? A couple years before we land? So that's, the, that's when we make extra investment to get what we need to make it to the moon. That peak adjusted for inflation is 46 billion dollars in one year. That's more than twice what we spend on NASA today. So when I say unlimited, I don't mean truly unlimited, but it feels like you're starting to get close to it. Well, no matter how well informed you are, no matter how well read you are, you got to admit, most of what you know comes to you through the mass media. And in this period, the mass media was telling us you should support this program. Mass media was very different then compared to now. Uh, and they were telling us, you should support this program. So where did the mass media get its information from? Well, it was coming directly from NASA. NASA manages this whole thing as a public relations endeavor. And they're churning out press releases. And they're saying, yes, we do need manned missions. Because people were saying, couldn't we do unmanned? We could still learn some things, but and it would be so much less expensive. No, 
We need humans as part of this experience. Well, are those guys really flying the spacecraft or is there just a computer doing all the work? No, NASA would say they are flying the spacecraft. They were quick to point out that all of those early astronauts had come from a background where they worked as military test pilots. Well, a test pilot, pretty much by definition, you are doing something that has never been done and if you run into a problem, you better stay calm and work the problem or you might not be coming home. Perfect people to be doing something like this. Going to the moon is a frontier adventure. We have sailed every ocean, we have climbed every mountain, the moon is there, we need to go. Well, there was a guy in the mass media who was hearing all this messaging from NASA and his name was Henry Lewis. Now, he was the publisher of a magazine called Life Magazine. Now, Life Magazine, back in this time period, was the, had the biggest subscription of, base of, of any magazine. There was nothing even, I mean today there's not, a, nobody buys magazines today, but in those days everybody, everybody had a subscription to Life Magazine. And he decides he wants to use his magazine to help. So he, he, he supposedly was a rabid anti-communist. He hated the Russians and he loved the space program. He saw this is our chance to move ahead. So Life Magazine cuts a deal with NASA. Life, and this is very well documented, Life Magazine paid NASA $500,000, now this was in the late 1950s. The money went directly to the seven astronauts, and then in return, Life Magazine gets exclusive behind the scenes access to the astronauts and the program. And so they start churning out issues, like the one on the left are the seven astronauts, their life stories. Well, then we want to know, what do their families think? So the one in the middle, those are the seven wives. And then the one on the right, it says, John Glenn, the making of a brave man. So you have this magazine with this huge subscription base. And by the way, that magazine has an exclusive behind the scenes access deal to the astronauts in the program. So people, you know, and then also the American people are kind of curious about this. And so here your, your issue shows up in the mail. And so you open it up and you, it was a picture magazine, so it told stories through pictures. So that you look at the pictures and then you read the stories that go with the pictures. And those stories would have themes like apple pie, patriotism, and national defense. The messaging in those stories was, you are unpatriotic if you don't support this program. Well, getting to the moon involved three different programs under NASA. The first was called Project Mercury, second is called Gemini, and the third is called Apollo. On this list, the two that get the most attention are Mercury and Apollo. Mercury got us into space, Apollo got us to the moon, but I think you could make an argument the most important one might have been Gemini. Uh, that is the one where we did this sort of really hardcore technical work to figure out how do you operate in outer space. There's no gravity. There's no oxygen, the vacuum of space. How do you operate in an environment like that? It's pretty clear that if we had not had Gemini, we never would have been successful with Apollo. So we've been through Mercury, we've been through Gemini, we're ready to launch, start the Apollo program. It's 1967, we have a chance, the end of the decade is coming, but we have a, still have a chance to make it. So the Apollo program is starting. Well, it got off to a horrible start. In January of 67, there was a mission that we named Apollo 1. They were doing what amounted to a dress rehearsal for a launch, you know, so you have three astronauts in their space who's locked in the capsule, and they're going through checklists and flipping levers and pushing buttons in the prescribed order, and then they're talking to mission control. You have all those guys at their consoles in mission control and everything. It was a test. It was everything but the final button to, to launch the thing. The test was going very badly. They kept running into one problem after another, after another, and then in the middle of the test, something inside the capsule caused a spark. The spark turned into a fireball, and those three astronauts died in less than a minute. This was the beginning of the Apollo program. So the first thing is we just have to figure out what caused the fire. And then we all had to say, why are we having all these problems? What is going on here? So we take a full review of the program. And as a result of that full review, we stopped sending humans into outer space for more than a year and a half. 
The fire is January 67. The next manned mission was October 68, and that one was called Apollo 7. The ones between two and seven, between one and seven, were unmanned. Well, Apollo 7 goes pretty close to by the book, so it looks like we have fixed our problems. We're back on track. So now I'm going to show you the steps we took to get to the moon. Apollo 7 stays in Earth orbit, goes pretty close to by the book, okay? The next one is Apollo 8. Well, what can they do to get us closer to our goal? I think you could say that Apollo 8 might have taken a risk that was bigger than actually landing on the moon. Apollo 8 went to the moon. Now they don't even have a spacecraft with them that can land on the moon. They went to the moon, orbited 10 times, and came home. But he, Now, they are the first humans in history to leave Earth. Can you get back? Yup, we're pretty sure you can. Okay? <laughs> All right. Now, they're flying to the moon. The Earth is behind them. They go around the back side of the moon, and then here they came around, and this is what they saw. And this is a very famous picture called Earthrise. This is the gray surface of the moon, and out in this inky blackness of space is a tiny little blue ball called Earth. First humans in history to see this view. Now again, Apollo 8 doesn't even have a craft that can land on the moon. They just orbited 10 times and came home. The next mission is Apollo 9. Now they had a craft that could land on the moon. It's called the Lunar Module, but they stayed and tested it in Earth orbit. This is a picture of what the Lunar Module looks like. This is a later one on the moon, but um, people call it sort of a spidery looking craft. So Apollo 9 tests this in Earth orbit. Apollo 10 goes to the moon. They have a lunar module. They tested everything in lunar orbit. So now we're ready to attempt the first landing with Apollo 11. <coughs> Apollo 11's mission, they launched off the Earth on July 16th, splashed down in the ocean on July 24th. So Armstrong and Aldrin, you got these two crafts now, the, the mothership, the command module, and the lunar module, and they separate. So now Armstrong and Aldrin are in this lunar module, and they're descending to the surface of the moon and there's a computer giving them guidance data. The computer couldn't handle it. Uh, the computer starts to overload. Uh, there is m supposedly more computer technology in your smartphone than there was in the computer inside the lunar module in 1969, okay? So the computer is directing them to, got to land at a spot where there were boulders and craters. And you know, you saw that picture. That thing needs a flat spot to land. So Neil Armstrong says, I'm flying this thing. He takes manual control away from the computer. He flies over where they were headed to land until he finds a flat spot and sets down. But see, that burns extra fuel and everything's measured very precisely. By the time they landed, they had less than 30 seconds of fuel remaining. Now, to be clear, that's 30 seconds for the landing. Nobody in 1969 had thought, I wonder if we should build this in such a way that if we run a little short on the landing, we can tap it. No, nope. they, they have a separate reserve for the launch later on, but those are completely separate reserves of fuel. There is no way to, so if they run out of fuel, they crash into the moon, probably damaging the spacecraft. They're on the moon for 21 hours. The two men get out and walk around for two and a half hours. EVA stands for extravehicular activity, and they bring back 47 pounds of rocks. Thus, we have accomplished the goal that President Kennedy set back in 1961. Now, I like to play the what if game. What if some things had gone just a little differently? How would we view this event? The first one I've touched on already, I want to expand on it a little bit more. What if President Kennedy had not been assassinated in 1963? So he sets us on this course, he gets assassinated in 63, but what if he lives? Well, he probably gets reelected in 1964, and then as you move through the 60s, he's now a second term lame duck president, and I could see a scenario where people would start to say, We've been talking about this for years. We've been spending billions of dollars. We're still not there. Maybe it's time to just pull the plug on the program. I could see that as a scenario. But when he's assassinated, the guy who took his, plot, his spot was Lyndon Johnson. Now, most people say Johnson was a huge fan of the space program, and he's keeping us moving toward this goal. And I think one thing that is interesting today 
You could go to Houston, Texas. That's where NASA has its headquarters. You know what they're called? The Lyndon B. Johnson Space Center. He was probably the best friend NASA ever had, and he was the one in the Oval Office with his foot on the accelerator pushing us toward this goal. Another what if. What if that fire hadn't happened? Now, as tragic as it was, number one, we're fortunate it happens on the ground. Because if it doesn't happen on the ground, we probably keep charging ahead and it maybe happens in space. And if it happens in space, then it gets really hard to diagnose. As tragic as it was, I have heard people say that fire saved the program. Because it made us say, why are we having all these problems? We need to they take this full review, we need everybody to do their jobs, or people might die. And here's the example. It made us get our act together, get back on track, fix the problems, and meet our goal. Another what if. What if the lunar module runs out of fuel and it crashes into the surface of the moon, damaging the spacecraft? Or what if they have been on the moon and now they're ready to launch off the moon and for some reason that doesn't work? Either way, there was no provision for any sort of a rescue mission. If those two guys couldn't get off the surface of the moon, they would have died there. Now, how would we view this event today if that had been the outcome? Well, let's see, we accomplished half of President Kennedy's goal. We got to the moon, but we couldn't get off of it. It would be viewed as one of, I mean, it's not, it's not like they're up there and they, they were killed. They're still alive, but they ain't coming home. Imagine if that had been the scenario. Um, the last what if, what if a moon bug was found? Pe there were people saying, you're going to this alien environment. There's got to be a bug, a virus, a bacteria, an organism, and you're going to bring back rocks and dirt on your spacesuits, and you're going to, going to unleash this thing on the human race, and we're completely unprepared. So as a result of that last concern, the Apollo 11 astronauts had to go into quarantine for almost three weeks. They're plucked out of the ocean, taken to the deck of a ship, and they actually had a, an Airstream trailer on the deck of the ship, and they went in there and shut the door, and then those guys had to spend three weeks. There's President Nixon uh, is now in office by that point, and he's on the deck of the ship talking to him. But those guys had to spend about three weeks having all kinds of medical tests done to them. Well, they didn't find anything. So the next mission had a shorter quarantine and so on until they just said there is no such thing as a moon bug. I'm getting kind of close to the end, but I get asked a lot about what's going on today. You know, and it's, I'll, I'll confess, I find this history, this story I've been telling, far more interesting than what's happening today. There are people saying we need to go back to the moon. There are people saying we need to go to Mars. There are people saying we need to go to the moon on the way to Mars. We have billionaires spending their fortunes to take people into space for seven minutes at a time and so on. And I, and I don't know, it's interesting, but it's not as interesting as this history. I, Today, we don't have a clear focus. In the 60s, everybody knew exactly what the goal was, the, the moon. There was no debate. But today, we're kind of all over the board. So it, it seems hard to believe that we're going to be able to come to some kind of agreement. We really don't have very much competition today. We have a little bit. There's no debate. We do have some, but it's nothing like the competition was in the Cold War with the Soviet Union. Also, the budgets have been flat. And I don't know, I think if we're going to do some of these things, we're going to have to spend some more money. Now, I don't know, maybe if, if we have, um, you know, wealthy people, billionaires who want to spend their fortunes to help this effort, that's, you know, that's a, that's a, a wild card that I, I can't account for. But uh, if it's going to have to come from the government, from us, I don't know. I have a hard time imagining that there's going to be broad, bipartisan support for spending a lot more money in outer space when we have so many problems here on Earth. I just have a hard time. I feel like we're going to announce these plans and we'll get it a few years down the road and Congress flips, the White House flips, and now we've totally changed directions and we scrapped the program. That's what I think is likely to happen. So we'll see. Now I have one more video. Uh, this one is President Kennedy, so he made two famous moon speeches. The first was May of 61, where he just set us on this course. Then in September of 62, so a little more than a year and a half later, he goes to 
Rice University in Texas, that's right out in Houston, and they were getting ready to build the NASA's headquarters there. And so he goes there and gives a speech, uh, and by this point now, plans have been a little more crystallized and so fleshed out a bit and so on, and he delivers this speech. Uh, and it's, the video is about two minutes long, but in the video he, first of all, they're, they're, they're giving the speech on the football field, so he makes a football joke. And then also it's apparently very hot there that day, so he makes a joke about how hot it is. So, but anyway, this is kind of a, an interesting little video, and so here we go. Why some say the moon? Why choose this as our goal? And they may well ask, why not climb the highest mountain? Why 35 years ago fly the Atlantic? Why does Bryce play Texas? We choose to go to the moon. We choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other thing. Not because they are easy, but because they are hard. Because that goal will serve to organize and measure the best of our energies and skills. Because that challenge is one that we're willing to accept, one we are unwilling to postpone, and one we intend to win and the others too. We shall send to the moon 240,000 miles away from the control station in Houston, a giant rocket more than 300 feet tall, the length of this football field, made of new metal alloys, some of which have not yet been invented, capable of standing heat and stresses, several times more than have ever been experienced, fitted together with a precision better than the finest watch, carrying all the equipment needed for propulsion, guidance, control, communications, food, and survival, on an untried mission to an unknown celestial body, and then return it safely to Earth, re-entering the atmosphere at speeds of over 25,000 miles per hour, causing heat about half that on the temperature of the sun, almost as hot as it is here today, and do all this, and do all this, and do it right, and do it first, before this decade is out, then we must be bold. Okay, so I think that's kind of cool. So I'm going to finish up with one more quote, and this is another uh, pioneer in broadcast journalism, Walter Cronkite. So now he was the lead anchor on CBS News from 1962 to 1981. And he was at one point uh, named the most trusted man in America. If you can imagine a t news anchor being named the most trusted man in America. People called him Uncle Walter. But he retires in 1981 and he writes a book in the, I think it was the mid 90s called The Reporter's Life. Now, <clears throat> Uh, I think he had a fascinating career and he reported on this going to the moon and I, I like from his book something he said about that story. This is what he said. Of all humankind's achievements in the 20th century, the one event that will dominate the history books 500 years from now will be our escape from our earthly environment and landing on the moon. So, today in school there are kids studying the 1400s and the 1500s. 500 years from now, there will be kids studying the 1900s. And, you know, if you really like history, we could spend all afternoon coming up with a long list of all the big, important historical events that happened in the 1900s. But 500 years from now, when that 100-year period is reduced to a chapter or a page or maybe even just a paragraph in a history book, they're probably going to say that was when we went to the moon. And I bet he might be right about that. And that says I've reached the end. So thank you so much for inviting me to speak today. Thank you. Thank you. Happy to answer any questions or comments, anybody? You think yeah. Sputnik was just like a show off of their ICBMs? Was it, do I think Sputnik was a show off of their ICBMs? No, I think it was just they needed to, to, to practice a launch and getting something into orbit. Uh, I don't think they were as far along on that ICBM as we suspected they were at the time, you know, but they, they just wanted to do this showy thing, so that's my guess. So.
Why do you think they went back after Apollo 11? Well, that's an interesting question because if you, when you read about or study the Apollo program, the people involved, the astronauts, a lot of them thought, okay, we're going to go to the moon and then we'll go there. First, we'll just go there for less than a day and the next mission was going to be there for a couple days. And then the, I think it was Apollo 17 was the last one. And they were on the moon for almost two weeks. Okay, so the plan was we're going to really, we're going to we'll figure this out. And then the next step is now we're going to go to Mars. But what happened was after Apollo 11, the American people kind of lost interest. Well, after we got to the moon, we kind of lost interest. And so the, you know, like the, the ratings for watching the, the coverage of Apollo 12, the next one was half of what Apollo 11 was. And by the time we got to 17, people didn't care about it anymore. The American people it just completely lost support. Um, now, there was a lot of other stuff going on, the Vietnam War and all those kinds of things. And I think um, we, we kept going back because that was the original plan. But at some point, they said, no, nah, that's enough. And we're just going to cut it off. And, and then we, now we have things that the things we do today are called low Earth orbit, which is like the space station, and we had the space shuttle for a while. And that's, that's all to get outside of low Earth orbit is to go to the moon or beyond. And we haven't done any of that in a long time, except you know with some unmanned stuff. So, so I think what happened was that was the plan all along to keep going, but then people just kind of lost interest. The, the American people lost interest. The support for the program just died. So. So what is NASA spending their $20 billion on? It's not <laughs> well, no, yeah, if you were to, to, to have a representative of NASA, I saw one on the news the other day where the guy said there's this plan that we're going to put humans back on the moon in 2024 or 2025. And then, you know, the next thing is to go to Mars. I don't know. I'll, we'll see. I'm skeptical. I just have a hard time imagining that's going to actually play out. I think we're going to we're going to get partway through the effort, and then yeah, and the funding kind of dries up, or parties switch, the Congress and the White House, all this stuff. I just think we're going to. He sets the goal in 1961. By the end of the 60s, so depending on, okay, so let's say eight or nine years. That's our goal is to, to accomplish this. We don't have the attention span to do something today that takes eight or nine years to do. We get two, three, four years in and we lose interest and we move on and we flip and we change directions. So that's why I just don't, I'm skeptical that we're going to get any of that done. So. You know, what I found was really interesting, you guys, is just the, the things that Mike talked about at our party that we had and he talked about, you know, kind of casting the vision and some of the things I wrote down is like, um, his inspiration, like, we don't really know how to do this, but we're going to do it, you know? And I thought, wow, that's cool, just the way that they cast the vision in, in space. We have a lot of correlation with the way we do things. Like, the goal, we have to make a quantifiable goal. So when he says 192,000 units, we're going to have by 2032 instead of 2052. It's like, we have a number to go by, and it seems outrageous. But, you know, at least we have a number. And, if, you know, his, his quote was the same, I think, wasn't it a Kennedy quote that was, you know, if we miss, then we land amongst the stars, right? If yeah. we miss, then we land amongst the stars. <laughs> yeah. I thought that was interesting. So I just saw a lot of kind of things that mm -hmm. were parallel to the story. Cool. All of the, uh, I don't know if it's conspiracy theorists or what, but there's like a minute or two missing out of Neil Armstrong's. I'm talking about? Well, he was like talking like, they're here, look at what we're looking at. <laughs> <laughs> so there is a, there's a, a, a group of folks who believe that we didn't actually land on the moon. That this was actually done on a sound stage in Hollywood. Uh, and what happens is they take the videos and the, and the pictures and they they claim to see things in the background or they're saying something, you know, like if something is missing from an audio, well, how do you, how do you prove that it's not missing? You know, it's like proving a negative is very difficult. So, um, I don't know, you, you, in the end of the, at the end of the day, you kind of say, 
Either you believe we went to the moon or you don't. I believe we did. If, if you say we didn't, then why did we do it six times? You know, it's, why didn't we just do it once and say, okay, we're done, but we, we did it six times, so why? Has that supposed missing, missing audio ever been talked about, actually heard that audio? You know what I'm talking about? Or? Yeah, well, I, I can't remember exactly that, that specific detail, but usually what they're saying is, like, here, let me give you an example. So they'll say, okay, here are these pictures of these guys on the moon, and, and you look in the background, and you can't see any stars. Well, why? What, because there weren't any stars, because they were in Hollywood on a soundstage. Well, the, the answer to that is, the reason we can see stars is because of the Earth's atmosphere, the way the light shines through the Earth's atmosphere. That's why we see stars, okay? That's the answer, but if you don't know the answer to those kinds of things, it seems persuasive. And the, the audio thing, I've heard that. I can't remember the, you know, the answer to that one or what the exact circumstances are, but uh, it, you always find this laundry list and I don't know, I'm not, I don't buy it. Was it true that the Russians crashed, either crashed or were rotating on the other side of the moon while we were landing? They were, yeah. They, they, they tried to send an unmanned mission up there. They knew we were getting ready to send Apollo 11 and they were going to, they sent an unmanned and they, I think it was, I think might have crashed on the back side if I remember right. Yeah. So. So. Well. You a conspiracy nut, Tim? That's when they went to the Transformers ship. What is it? I don't know. It's on the dark side of the moon. One of them. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's hokey when people say that we didn't land on the moon. I absolutely believe we were there, but yeah. I just wonder about it. Yeah, I can't remember the specifics of that thing. I've. Yeah. So. Well. All right. Thanks, everybody.